Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here. Um, I've, um, I was quite surprised to be uh, asked to uh, carry out the presentation. Um, I've been doing a lot of work um, with um, looking back in our history, uh, written, oral, uh, and that led me to carry out a number of um, posts, and I've been doing monthly posts in LinkedIn, looking back at the history of earthquakes and how they've really influenced not just earthquake engineering, uh, but also real um, changes to uh, the political and economic life of the world. And some of the examples of those uh, earthquakes are posted here. Um, the first one uh, on the Cretan arc, uh, south of uh, Greece uh, in 1303, uh, caused uh, very large earthquake, big tsunami, big ground shaking, and led to the destruction or damage to two of the uh, wonders of the seven wonders of the world. The, the lighthouse at Alexandria uh, collapsed uh, after the event and um, was significantly damaged and then collapsed several years later. And also the uh, limestone cladding on the Great Giza, uh, Pyramid at Giza was said to have uh, fallen uh, during this earthquake. We moved to Lisbon in Portugal in 1755, a major earthquake and tsunami again. And people have linked this to the change and sort of the, the, the whole philosophy of enlightenment and the, the ability, the, the importance of science over uh, religious thought, uh, and it is linked with the French Revolution and possibly even with the American Revolution. Moving more forward, we get to Messina Straits in Italy, uh, turn of the 20th century. Damage caused major damage, earthquake and tsunami again. And I've posted this because of the importance relative to a project that's been on and off the books in Italy for many years, a major suspension bridge linking uh, the toe of Italy with Sicily. And it's back on the cards as of very recently. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of interesting considerations as to what that earthquake did, how it, how the, the tectonics of the region uh, uh, affected uh, both Sicily and uh, the Italian coastline, and how that would affect any bridge that may be designed in the future. And then moving on to the Great Kanto earthquake. Um, Japan, probably at the forefront of earthquake engineering, but if we look back in history, there have been some major events that have badly affected the Japanese mainland, and no more so than the Great Kanto earthquake. So these really started me thinking about how earthquake history has been important. And then I sort of reflected on the earthquakes that I have had uh, the ability to go and visit, either through for research purposes or for work purposes. Uh, and these have either been in person or remote assessments. Uh, for various projects. And this is just a selection of those events. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but um, I would say that the first event that I actually had uh, went to was in Los Angeles following the Northridge earthquake in 1994. But then I've been going back and learning every time from these earthquakes. And it's really important that we learn from what's observed so people don't make the same mistakes that they've made before. And that's a, a theme I'm going to come back to uh, later on in the uh, presentation. So the first thing, uh, our first earthquake I'm going to talk about is actually quite a small event. 
1989 Newcastle Australia event, only 5.6 magnitude, but it resulted in losses of about four billion uh, Australian dollars, led to thir- the death of 13 people and over 160 injured. It was a direct hit in an area of very low seismicity, and it reminded us that actually everywhere is at risk from earthquakes. At the time, we were actually carrying out a study of uh, seismic risk to the UK. Now you say UK doesn't have very many large earthquakes, but actually if you go back in history, the in 1580, there was the Dover Straits earthquake, magnitude 5.8. More recently in th- 1939, the Dogger Bank earthquake, magnitude 6.1, felt across the whole country. If we were to get a recurrence of a, a Newcastle style earthquake under a conurbation in the UK, there would be significant cost and damage. So we were carrying out this study. We looked at uh, the hazard. We looked at the vulnerability of the building stock and estimated both uh, potential losses of life for various scenarios and the implication in costs. When you look at the costs from an annual uh, risk perspective, the numbers are too small to really be significant, especially when you compare it with flooding, the effect of climate change and so forth. However, the annual cost at 1990 prices was equivalent to 100 million uh, pounds per year. But it's not an uh, event that occurs once every year. It might be an event which will occur once every 500 years. So it, it can aggregate to quite a large number. And it's one of the issues we have to deal with in terms of deciding in the UK what type of structures really need to be considered for earthquake uh, loading. Moving on um, to Northridge. And as I said, this was the first event I had uh, actually visited. I walked around for Uh, over a week investigating this as part of the earthquake engineering field investigation team. And actually, the structure I show here, the parking garage, which uh, failed, um, was the first structure I looked at. And it was one of those eureka moments, because you can observe the perfect ductility of the exterior columns, how their crack patterns uh, suggest that the steel was very well laid out, good detailing, etc. But the devil was in the detail. The, the supports for the precast concrete beams were within the actual structure were inadequate, and that caused the internal column uh, beams to collapse and pull the whole structure in. And it's those sort of simple little details that have time and time again been really critical to the performance of structures, in my opinion. The earthquake was relatively modest, 6.7. We learned all about blind thrust faults. We hadn't identified a structure that was responsible for the Northridge earthquake prior to the event. Now we know it very well. The aftershock sequence allowed us to actually understand that. Total of about 72 fatalities, um, relatively modest number again, 9,000 injuries, uh, over 100,000 people temporarily homeless. But if you then start looking at the direct losses, and these are in US dollars on the day of the event, 20 billion in direct losses and 49 billion in indirect losses. These are significant numbers. Uh, There are a number of issues structurally. The bridges were seen to perform badly and there's been a lot of work done in that area. Uh, Steel frame buildings were seen to perform badly in the connections and a lot of work has been done in that area. Geotechnically, there was less. Uh, Liquefaction damage occurred uh, again at the upper San Fernando Dam, 
and the associated pipeline infrastructure, but it was relatively modest. There was liquefaction damage at uh, King Harbour, but again, relatively modest. The thing that jumped out at me was the slope failures at Pacific Pal Palisades. And the thought came to me, should we really be considering topographic amplification? And I went around, went home, and I investigated this. And I noted that there had already been codified rules available in Europe since the early 1990s. Uh, the French Association for Earthquake Engineering, AFPS, published a design code in 92. A summary of that is on the right-hand side. And that indicated potentials for topographic amplification. Eurocode 8 then took that on board as part of Annex A of uh, Eurocode 8 Part 5, and that suggests potential increases in peak ground acceleration of up to 40% with slopes greater than 30 degrees. Now, that amplification is only within uh, the height of the slope. So if the slope is, say, 60 foot high, it's only within a 60 foot region at the top of the slope. But with lots and lots of architects that I've had experience of, they like to have, and people like to build buildings, condominia, with lovely views. It's an interesting point, but why hasn't this been adopted more widely? I'm only aware of topographic amplification being put into codes within Europe. Why is that? The next earthquake uh, I looked at was the Kobe earthquake. Um, and what you see on the right hand side is the collapse of the Great Hanshin Expressway. This made front page news, very significant uh, damage. Um, moment magnitude nine event, over 6,000 fatalities, 40,000 injured, and many left homeless. Over 100 billion in direct losses. So this was though it was only 0.2 of a magnitude higher, and I know the energy scale is logarithmic, but a five times increase in the direct losses compared to Northridge. And it really brought home the vulnerability of infrastructure. There was issues at Port Island, the picture of the Great Hanshin Expressway, and the big, what was then the longest suspension bridge uh, in the world, the Akai Kaiko Bridge, which extended in length as a consequence of the earthquake. These, this event really changed the way we've looked at infrastructure. If I start with Port Island, uh, there was widespread liquefaction, caused the collapse of key walls, cranes, and so forth. Uh, there were loss of operations at the port, and those in just the port operations were estimated to be about 6 billion US. The bigger issue was the port actually permanently lost over 20% of its business to the port of Osaka, and they've never got it back. Kobe was the gateway for most trade in Japan. It is that no longer. This one event changed that level, the social and economic balance within Japan. One of the real positives that came out of this was the development of the Piank Seismic Design Guidelines. It defined performance targets. It identified, it allowed you as an engineer to talk to your client and say, what do you want for your port? Is your port critical for the business in this region? Or are there other ports that can take over if a big earthquake occurs? How much are you willing to invest in protecting your um, facility? That work is now being reviewed and I'm luckily, I'm on the committee looking at that. So we're seeing as to what lessons that we've seen over the last uh, 25 years that are, can be used to uh, improve that uh, set of design guidelines. But actually, the Kobe earthquake also allowed us to think about what's acceptable performance. And just a couple of examples. 
Uh, the Nishima Harbour Bridge, and uh, part of the Hanshin Expressway again. Actually, the br main bridge performed really well, but the approach span failed because of lateral spreading at the right-hand um, support. Consider if there's a critical facility on either side, that failure of that span creates an issue for that critical facility, could it be a hospital or something? We know generally that hospitals performed really badly in the Kobe earthquake. Out of 180, four were destroyed, 12 were severely damaged, and only four suffered no damage. I mean, the picture at the bottom, that's a soft story collapse. It's it has changed the way that people have considered the importance of hospitals, and rightly so. Likewise, big business has also uh, had a wake-up call. Uh, Procter & Gamble had put together, had developed a new uh, Far East headquarters in Kobe before, before the earthquake. It took, though it performed well in the earthquake, it was damaged, and it took them a considerable period of time before they re could reoccupy that building. Um, the work was, the, the design was fine, but the downtown downtime costs to Procter & Gamble were significant, and it actually made them consider their building stock around the world, be it in their manufacturing plants, be it in other headquarters buildings, and they commissioned several consultants, including Arup, to look at this and assess the ability of their uh, business to carry on in the event of a major event, major earthquake. I would say that this helped to contribute to the publication of Vision 2000. Uh, obviously, there was lots and lots of parts to that, but really this whole idea of performance and what's acceptable came out of these earthquakes in the mid 90s. Moving now to Turkey, and we'll we'll touch on uh, the recent Turkey earthquake a bit later. But one thing I'd like you to do is consider the similarities bet before between what we observed in 1999 and what we've observed uh, last month. The Kocheli earthquake was a magnitude 7.4. Um, it created uh, 126 kilometers of fault rupture, maximum right lateral displacement of about five and a half meters. There was a tsunami, a minor, minor tsunami on the coast of the Marmara Sea, and officially about 17,000 fatalities uh, and direct losses of 20 billion US. You go from um, town to town, and this is the typical sort of damage. Uh, an open ground floor, some sort of soft story collapse, poor confining steel, uh, inappropriate use of laps, um, not enough shear reinforcement, uh, found foundations without piles in liquefiable ground, leading to collapse of buildings. Now, one of the things we, we actually had a big uh, pr prototype test. We'd worked with um, for Toyota uh, before, uh, about five years before the earthquake, uh, in the design of a new car factory. This was near uh, Adipazari, and was badly, well, was very close to the fault rupture of the earthquake. A uh, fault rupture passes through uh, from Goliatka in the east all the way through to Golchuk in the west. And Adipazari and Sapancha, where the, um, the Toyota factory is, was very much uh, right in the middle of the, the fault. Now, when our staff uh, carried out the work, they carried out a very detailed desk study 
satellite imagery was only relatively recently available and they studied the satellite images uh, in a lot of detail that identified that a, a major arm of the fault was running quite close to the site. Additionally, the site had previously been uh, looked at by another uh, potential uh, manufacturer who'd drilled a very deep borehole. When we looked at the deep borehole, we found that the, uh, the borehole trace was, um, or log was disrupted and there was a fault trace. And we linked that to a potential fault on the um, satellite imagery. And so we realigned uh, the orientation of the buildings. We strengthened the foundation. It led to an increased cost uh, to about 80 million US for the construction. But during the earthquake, there was only some minor ancillary damage. You can see some of that on the right hand side. Uh, machines moved, uh, some of the roadways were cracked, some of the pipelines uh, failed, but generally uh, it was uh, the buildings were fine and actually the plant was ready to recommence operation a few weeks after the earthquake. As a consequence of that, uh, we were brought on board uh, by Ford, who were in the process of constructing another car factory, this time near Golchuk. Um, if we look at the satellite imagery, those with a keen eye may be able to spot the fault. I'm just going to highlight it here and take that away just so you can try and see where the, f the fault was on the satellite image. The white box represents approximately where the factory was being built. And this is the scenario where Ford were, asked, were basically asked by the government to build in Golchuk to improve the economy of the local area. And they were given the land for free to build on. After the earthquake, when we investigated the area and talked to the locals, the locals said that that land, we asked the question, why hadn't that land been developed before? It's bad land, it's grazing land. Actually, it's a delta. There's a little river that runs um, north-south um, and comes out into the Marmara Sea, Ismit Bay. So we've got alluvial deposits. There was a step already in the ground marking previous uh, fault movements. Was it a good place to build? No. But uh, we ended up having to uh, advise Ford as to what could be done. And the first part of that was really assessing the level of damage, both in terms of geotechnical damage and structural damage. Uh, some of the images on the geotechnical impacts are seen here. We've got the fault movement. Now, it was mainly a strike slip fault, but at this location, there was a, a step over structure and caused a two meter vertical settlement at the step over structure. That's my colleague, Matthew Free, who's uh, just short of uh, uh, six foot uh, high. Uh, and that resulted in this major vertical movement. There was a release of methane from the ground. There were some other bore, water uh, extraction boreholes uh, in the area. And there was a release of methane. And clearly methane and a car factory is not a good mix. So a lot of work had to be done to uh, ensure that the gas that may be released in the future from the ground would not affect the, uh, the welding operations within the uh, car factory. And then along the uh, coastline, there was both li liquefaction and lateral spreading, and the plant needed a uh, jetty for uh, import and export. So that made the design of the jetty more uh, complex. 
from a structural perspective, the body shop was the main uh, building that got damaged. Uh, and it got damaged because and you've got to have a very keen eye here. Actually, the ground warped. It contracted and warped. So the middle image, you can just see how the cladding uh, bows in the middle. And that's, that, that's a movement of, of approximately uh, a foot in the vertical direction. And then in the right hand side, uh, halfway along this wall, there's actually a door which closed by up to uh, a foot and a half. So there are big movements within the ground that have affected the building. St structurally, overall, the building was fine, but really the ground was uh, unacceptable. So the, the, the whole building was demolished and moved further away from the fault. It's one of those scenarios that the plant is still there, it is still operating, um, and it was n neither uh, Ford nor the, nor the people who got them to, to move into the area could be seen to not carry on operating. So the, the level of design that's gone into the, um, the finished product is well and above uh, Turkish design codes because this is really an inappropriate place to design, uh, to build. So, moving on. Um, if we look now to the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, and I was involved uh, in two missions to the, the region, uh, and specifically to Aceh at the north coast, north point of um, Indonesia on the island of Sumatra. And this was looking at the rebuilding of uh, the region following the earthquake and tsunami. Moment magnitude 9.3 event, huge subsea fault rupture, inundating many countries. In Aceh itself, there were 167,000 fatalities. And I'm not going to tell you some of the stories we heard, but actually it's one of those scenarios where going to the, the event really changed my life and changed my appreciation of Mother Nature. Um, and here are just some of the images. This is just one of the several boats that were thrown inland by up to miles in some cases. Uh, bottom left is a uh, limestone atoll. The tree line that you can see where the, the trees have been ripped by the power of the tsunami is uh, 10 meters high. So you're talking uh, well over um, 32 uh, feet. Uh, some of the few buildings that survived were mosques because their ground floors were open and the water could pass through. But generally, what you see in the bottom right is what was prevalent throughout the region. It was like the slate being wiped clean. And it was so dramatic. Um, and it, it's it, these are images and memories that will last for me forever. Um, I was only there twice for two weeks each time, and for we didn't arrive in country till a good nine months after the the initial event. We were there to help in the reconstruction, and one of the things that clearly jumped out at us is that people were trying to reconstruct against another tsunami. But in a low income country, is that reasonable? And what should they be really thinking about? On the right hand side, you can see a sketch of the north of um, Sumatra Island. Aceh is right at the north end. And the red line is the Great Sumatran Fault. 
but that's a strike slip fault similar to San Andreas or the Northern Anatolian fault that passes right through the middle of the, the region. There are several volcanoes in the region. And then you've got the risk of tsunami. Now, is it really practical for housing to be designed against a devastating event? Most of the land, most of the people uh, have work on the land as farmers or work in the sea as fishers. So you're looking at people needing to be on low lying areas which are, they can cultivate, they need to be near to the sea. And really, the, the pr principle was providing housing that was appropriate, um, but then ensuring there were appropriate monitoring and early warning systems and evacuation plans and teaching the local population how to, um, wh where are safe areas for them to move to. There are other natural hazards that need to be considered. There's obviously, we're just south of the monsoon uh, region, but you're still getting over six inches of rain per uh, month. So there's still high winds, there's still chances of flooding and hence landslides. So really the conclusions are avoid areas at risk, uh, engineer drainage systems and earthquakes, and really site selection is key. And this was a real issue. At the time, uh, there was uh, a, a, a relatively good seismic design code. At that time, it was probably equivalent to UBC uh, 1997, and there were some building regulations. However, the seismic design code was only valid for buildings above three stories. And we only discovered this once we were in, in country and actually talking to the local engineers. The regulations also didn't cover things like the size of the wall panels, openings in those panels, tying of the wall panels how to provide appropriate sill and lintel beams within the building. And there were so many other issues. As a part of that, we put together a guide called Lessons from Ache to help in the actual uh, rehabilitation of the region and in future. And it really fell into three key areas of planning, design and construction. Now we as engineers potentially are interested in the natural hazards, light selection and surveys, design of houses and construction management, but actually there's so much more. And especially where you're dealing with a displaced community, actually understanding all these other aspects ensure that the final solution is one that is sustainable. And it's, it, you know, you could talk about this for hours uh, to get to an adequate situations. Moving on to the Maule earthquake in Chile, um, I led a team to the um, region fo following the Maule earthquake. And one of the things that struck me was not only the size of the earthquake, but the, the area that was affected. Two million people were affected by the earthquake, only a death toll of 520. Direct losses were significant, um, 30 billion US. But then I stopped to think, and actually I was working on at the time uh, a seismic hazard assessment for um, a facility in further northern Chile between the latitudes of 20 south and 30 south. When you looked at the number of earthquakes in the region, it's jumped out at me. Every year you expect at least one magnitude 6.7 event in Chile. In that, in the northern part of Chile, it's the same in the southern part of Chile. A magnitude eight event every 10 years. Structures will see their design event in Chile. It's inevitable. And actually then when we started looking at the building stock, most buildings performed really well. <laughs> it often was difficult to see any damage. Uh, predominantly reinforced concrete shear wall construction, 
And what we noticed also, regular layout, vertically and horizontally, no open ground floors. And it, it, again, talking to the local engineers, it, we realized that the design philosophy is different. You know, it's, they understand that very large earthquakes will occur. And this requires more regular, higher performing structures. And generally, that's what was the case. There were uh, some exceptions. Uh, this was the Torre O'Higgins in Concepcion uh, towards the south of the region. And there are a number of soft story collapses within that structure, but all at where the regularity was removed through architectural change within the building. And really, I think this earthquake tells us about the importance of regularity in our building design if we want better performing buildings. The other thing in Chile was the road network suffered badly. Uh, there was a lot of lateral spreading and movement of abutments uh, for the bridges and many collapsed. Uh, luckily, there was the, the, the road network was set up that there was a a separate uh, up and down carriageway, and sometimes that benefited with one of the sets of bridges surviving and the other one not surviving. Uh, but the, the impact were was significant to the the road network. Uh, there was a huge uh, tsunami impact along the coast, and especially in the towns of Constitution and Concepcion. And I'm just going to focus on what we carried out some work in uh, Constitution. It's a town, relatively small town, population of 38,000, um, founded in 1794, and it was uh, it's the centre of the commercial uh, logging trade. And there's a big uh, logging uh, factory uh, run by Aralco uh, in the in the town. But when you look at history. In 1835, there was a magnitude 8.2 event, and this is the mapped area that was inundated during that event. If you map the damage in 2010, it's almost, you could almost overlay it one for one. Yet they knew it had happened and they carried on building it in the areas at risk. Here are some of the images of damage. We can see uh, the low lying area with the grid pattern of roads. Uh, a lot of buildings just wiped away by the tsunami. Uh, part of the uh, Aralco um, facility, uh, the storage uh, sheds uh, badly damaged. But some more modern buildings, regular again, uh, performed really well. Uh, we became part of a consortium with uh, Chilean uh, partners to actually try and come up with a master plan for the region, for the town. Uh, and this uh, looked at uh, coming up with some initial uh, modeling of um, remediation measures. We were looking at maximum uh, flow velocities and maximum tsunami heights and modeling them against what was observed so we could get ensure that our models were as accurate as possible and then we selected uh, mitigation measures now we were lucky in, or constitution is lucky it has an area of higher land close to the mouth of the the river which protects from a direct uh, impact from the tsunami but it's protection along the riverbank that was key. And landscaping uh, along that um, area could reduce water flows to a point that they wouldn't impact on the buildings themselves. We, buildings would get wet, but there wouldn't be the, the mass uh, collapse that we've observed both in 1834, 35, and uh, more recently in 2010. A lot of work has gone into tsunami guidance following this, uh, the Boxing Day tsunami, the Maule earthquake uh, and other tsunamis. There are guidelines in Japan, there are US guidelines. 
they don't necessarily give the same answers uh, and you can see the the loading patterns from the two on the right hand side they don't always consider debris flow and how a foundation performs or scour issues uh, how one structure interacts with another and causes funnels of water and then thinking about load combinations if a building's been damaged by an earthquake how does it get affected by the subsequent tsunami there is more work required in this area to better understand tsunami loads talking about tsunamis 2010 tahaku earthquake it can't be ignored uh, one of the most devastating events uh, in modern history. Um, and I'm going to focus on one particular issue, that of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. I remember when the event occurred and the first reports were of the level of inundation. I looked at the uh, history of um, run-ups that had been recorded along the coast of Japan. And I thought, this has happened before. And now, once they've done detailed investigations, we could see that the observed run-ups were comparable to what had happened in 1896. And there are potentially larger events, not just in paleoseismic investigations, but in uh, from paleoseismic investigations, but from historical records in the past. Despite this, the nuclear power station was designed for the 1960 Valvadia Chile earthquake that affected the whole of the Pacific Rim. It had a run up of less than four meters at the nuclear power station. And even with a uh, margin of safety, was far less than the 15 meters of actual run up recorded at the plant. Work was ongoing to try and increase the level of the uh, tsunami wall at the nuclear power station, but unfortunately it was too late. Now, as it happens, we were working on a nuclear power station in the UK at the same time. And we'd actually been looking at the Lisbon earthquake as a potential source for uh, the, the Wilver nuclear power station. We'd actually compared it with observations of the Lisbon earthquake uh, in 1755 along the south coast of uh, the UK. So we verified the model based on known observations. But actually, the Tahaku earthquake made the team change tack and think about what do we actually not know? And really, this was the case of designing for the known unknowns. So rather than assessing something like a magnitude seven and a half, we looked at the impact of what a magnitude nine event could play on the nuclear power station. Luckily, I'm happy to say the run-ups were still uh, well within acceptable limits, but it's really that consideration of we don't know everything and we must really be uh, open to that uh, concept. So moving on to the modern day and the, the earthquake sequence in Turkey that's also affected Syria. Um, it occurred on the Eastern Anatolian Fault and immediately I heard about it. I started looking at what did I know about the region? And actually, when you look at it, uh, the city of Aleppo in Syria, which is about 100 kilometers south of the region, has repeated history of large events. And you can look at studies like Ambrasis's, um book on Eastern Mediterranean, and there are countless uh, discussions about Aleppo being damaged. In 1138, over 200,000 fatalities uh, have been estimated. More recently in 1822, somewhere between 30 and 60,000 fatalities. And it was felt across Rhodes, Cyprus uh, and, the, and Gaza. So there were big events in the past. Again, looking at the um, what had been published, uh, a very nice study by Duman and Emery looked at the historical events and linked those with the faults uh, 
of the Eastern Anatolian Fault, which on this map goes east-west and then passes down uh, into the Levant and the Dead Sea Fault uh, to the south. All of the bigger events on, in this image are, are well before the 20th century. And the recent events are a magnitude six event near Adana uh, and some uh, other magnitude uh, six events further north. There'd been no magnitude seven events over 150 years. So when the earthquake occurred uh, in early February, uh, on the 6th of February, it resulted in three of the previous segments of the fault that had caused single events all rupturing in one go. And then there was the follow on event, the magnitude 7.5 that ruptured the um, th these three segments. This event was very much at the high end of what could be expected, but shouldn't have been a surprise for the region. We then look at the comparison and on the left, we have pancake collapse in Golchuk in 1999 and Gaziantep in 2023, the same thing happening. Liquefaction in Golbazi in 2023, liquefaction collapse in Adipazari in 1999. Um, one of the things um, that jumped out, uh, my colleague here, Chem, who was part of the uh, initial uh, structural assessment team, uh, in discussion with him, it found that he tells me that Golbazi actually says uh, means edge of the lake. And actually, when you look at the map, it is on the edge of a lake. He talked to the locals. They said groundwater's just below the surface. You dig a hole for a foundation and it fills up. So the people knew that these um, that liquefaction was a real issue. There has been a lot of academic work recently looking at, well, People can walk out of buildings like this, but for me, this isn't resilience, and we should be thinking more about resilience of structures. So we need to make them both structurally sound and resilient for the future. Um, generally, older buildings performed worse, newer buildings performed better, though there were still a number of uh, fatalities uh, in newer buildings. Um, newer buildings tend to be taller and seem to be uh, f fall within uh, a range of where a, uh, a f potential f uh, seismic pulse was at around about two seconds. We will find out in due course as to how relevant that was. There was clearly poor detailing of structural members and connections, um, but we'll find out more. There have been some preliminary damage assessments. And you look at these numbers, um, these are um, damage states as defined in the uh, Turkish assessment for just uh, three of the towns in the region. And though there are unacceptable levels of collapse, it's not unheard of compared to other events. So I, all this, putting this lecture together actually made me think, uh, and I was cogitating what it was telling me. Um, and actually, I was, the more I was thinking about it, the more unhappy I was. So for me, it's telling me that there are increasing earthquake threats to vulnerable communities. In the Turkish earthquake sequence, we're seeing well over 50,000 fatalities in Turkey alone, and we let alone what we know about Syria. Rising earthquake losses. The initial estimate of direct and indirect losses for this earthquake is over 100 billion. That's close to 9% of the GDP of Turkey uh, 
for 2023. We've seen a significant improvement in seismic code development. There's been a lot of really good work done here, but why do we still see so much bad engineering, substandard construction and poor regulation? There needs to be a step change. And over 20 years ago, Vision 2000 brought us the concept of performance-based design, but why isn't it a default already? Why do we still talk about life safety? Do we as engineers discuss performance enough with our clients? One of the things I've been trying to highlight is what I call the seismic cycle. First starts off with understanding the stakeholders needs, be that the user, the client, the developer, whoever. What do they want? What are they prepared to pay for? Based on that, you define appropriate performance objectives and acceptable risk levels and make sure that the stakeholders understand that. We can then do the appropriate design and innovation that we enjoy, but we've got to ensure competent construction. And we've got to monitor the life cycle of the buildings and structures we build and review their performance because that helps us be more, uh, provide better guidance to our clients in the future. But really, is it that simple? I don't know. I think we forget about how a city develops. It's developed because of, it's a river crossing, it's a trading place. There's people, it attracts people. So there's an increase in settlement density. Sometimes there's uncontrolled development. We have different economic pressures, whether you're in a high income country, middle income country or low income country. And I think different things are appropriate in different situations. There are definitely different cultural and social differences. And we really need as engineers to understand what are people's key requirements. So, you know, I'm talking about performance and really that's appropriate to high income countries. Is it appropriate to low income countries? Maybe not, but maybe for the hospitals it is. We need to go through that whole process. And we must not forget other key drivers such as climate change and other hazards. If we're re retrofitting a building for seismic, why don't we retrofit it for seismic and energy at the same time? We need to think bigger. Thank you very much. Well, Ziggy, thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, Keller, Miriam Smith, who organized these presentations and myself, I really want to thank you for a very great presentation. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. We can stay later if people, uh, if, if it spills over. But if you please would uh, type your question in the chat box where Ziggy can uh, answer those, that would be great. Otherwise, I'd like to uh, award you with this virtual thank you, which uh, is not showing up. We will send you this shortly when we have uh, get that mailed to you. And uh, we really appreciate it. You have an open and standing invitation to join us here in Southern California anytime you're out here for for dinner, lunch, etc. We certainly would love to meet you in person. So again, thanks very much. Any Tim. questions? My pleasure. Folks are quiet. You can also raise your hand. Here we go. The video will be posted on our website, so I believe you'll be able to go into Keller.com and uh, it will be posted there somewhere. If you can find it, let me know. Thanks, Ramin. I've obviously uh, dumbed them all into silence. Well, it was so good, there's no questions. <laughs> well, but I, I, I actually want questions because yeah. I want to chat. I've, I've tried to challenge you all to think about how you can 
do things better for your clients and your the stakeholders who will be using the buildings that you're and structures that you're building. Here we go. Here's some questions. Uh, from okay. Miriam, do you see any changes to US code based on observations from recent Turkey events? Um I think the size of the earthquake will have surprised the earthquake engineering, the, the seismological community. The fact that all previous events were thought to have occurred just on one segment, yet this earthquake caused a uh, rupture on three segments, may lead to a consideration of how, let's say, the San Andreas Fault and the segments along the San Andreas Fault could link together in a major earthquake. Uh, but it, it's early days from that perspective. Um, I I mean, if, the question in Miriam's question in terms of codes, I'm thinking about the Turkish code itself. It's been updated four times since 1999. It is as good as any code in the world, be it Japan, New Zealand, uh, the USA. The code is not the problem. It's how it is applied. It is how uh, people actually ensure that the good intention of the designer gets translated to the final product. It's like a designer for a car drawing a wonderful sleek image and you get a lovely prototype and the final car is uh, a total disaster. Uh, and you, we need to recognize that actually there's a lot of good stuff that's been done, but I just want the simple stuff to be done correctly and we'll get a lot of the way to a better position. Thank you. I think the next one is from Lynn Yost. Are you planning to a trip to document damage from the recent Turkey earthquakes? So there are a number of studies that have uh, people, groups that have gone out. Uh, the group that I'm uh, sort of work with uh, the earthquake engineering field investigation team has uh, literally got back uh, from Turkey about three or four days ago. And in, I think in about 20 minutes, they are presenting to the UK community on their findings. Uh, but I th it's going to take months and years before we really get to the full details of uh, that. But uh, there'll be lots of thing, lots of publications, lots of presentations on the observations from the earthquake that will be coming uh, live. And I know uh, that a lot of them will be available through YouTube and the like. So uh, watch out uh, on uh, appropriate uh, channels for, for that. All right, the next question is from Ken Bray. Ziggy, thank you. For Northridge, what lessons learned do you observe with respect to the experience of engineers who are on the site? For me, Northridge, the biggest thing is the improvement in the bridge codes. Um, and Ashto, uh, the really uh, took a, a step change forward and you know it gets used internationally as a bridge code and is as as good as anything that's out there um we will have to see how yeah how it performs in the next main earthquake um in the us um but for me, it was really how the bridge code changed. There were structural issues with the um, beam column connections in steel buildings. Uh, there was a lot of work done on alternative connection details. But I think that was a, a sort of 
of a, a minor issue rather than sort of a major change. Great. Thank you. So the next question is from Saeed Askarian. There was a discussion about performance design. What about risk based design? Are there real experiences available for risk based design of structures for earthquakes? And following on, are there plans for including that in the codes? Uh, I think risk based design will be. We will be going there. I'm personally. I'm I don't think it is the right thing to do. Uh, it was interesting and I, I had too much to put into the presentation, but I, I saw a study of. Um, risk to the 50 the 50 most risk affected cities in the world and it it looked at uh those cities the cities of gaziantep or adana or you know the fact were affected the other um last month none of them were in that uh, assessment and that's because the assessment was based on 20 years worth of data and i think it's we do not have a long enough earthquake record to be fully able to do a detailed risk assessment too often i see you know scenario events being far more beneficial in risk assessment space. I think risk assessment has a, a really important part to play in planning. But in terms of design, um, there are too many unknowns for me, but I, I'm sure my academic friends may disagree with me. Thank you. Uh, this one from Vipal Kumar. Would you like to share your thoughts on the new suspension bridge being proposed in Italy? <laughs> well, um, we know that the um, the Strait to Messina has a major uh, fault running through it. Uh, recently, there was a lot of underwater investigation and they identified the fault they identified the size of the movement and we could expect similar movements to occur i think the question is what's an acceptable what's the appropriate design solution and i've been involved in work uh, in the gulf of aqaba looking at bridge connections between egypt and saudi arabia and there there's been considerations of floating bridges or floating tunnels. Um, and you get a dislocation on a floating bridge or a floating tunnel, and it works far more efficiently than something that's fixed to the ground. There are other issues to deal with, and you need to properly tie the structure down to the seabed. But I think there's got to be a lot of work done to understand what is the most appropriate and the safest, most resilient structure for the Strait to Messina. All right, thank you. So this next question is from Jay, pardon my pronunciation, Jay Dodapalapur. And he says, great presentation, Ziggy. In addition to revising codes and practices, would it be a case of educating clients to view project costs as secondary and focus more on performance? My, if we could get everybody to do that. <laughs> it, it would be lovely. Um, <laughs> I think there's two things. I think we should be made from a resilience and sustainability perspective. Obviously, upfront cost is part of the, the, the issue. And, you know, clients want to know what the upfront cost is. But we should also be having to tell them the um, life cycle cost. And if you consider a country like Chile and the large earthquakes that occur on a very regular basis, 
you have to do something better than the standard. Otherwise, your life cycle costs go through the roof. So it's it's actually understanding not just the immediate cost, but the life cycle costs and having a sensible discussion with the client as to what level of performance they require. Now, if they've got a, um, let's say it's a business and they've got a business model that has several headquarters buildings, it is unlikely that one earthquake will knock all of them out. Are they agile enough to relocate staff to carry on whilst that their one of their headquarters buildings is repaired? Yes, no. So it's it's often the discussion is not about the one structure, but how you use it as part of your whole business model. And it's I think it's down to us as the engineers to start those discussions with our clients. All right, uh, another one from Sinan Ikan Durmas. Thank you, Ziggy. Which ground improvement techniques would you use for residential buildings susceptible to liquefaction? Uh, thinking that such techniques like vibro and dynamic compaction is not feasible due to time and economics. Well, I, I think if there are if there are regions that want to be redeveloped and have uh, and that you've got poor ground and liquefaction potential, uh, you still need to consider doing something. Um, I know in Turkey, uh, jet grout columns are very, very popular. Um, you can consider looking at um, just improving the ground over the top five or six meters and then four structures which are relatively light and they can then sit on that and you may get settlements in future events but they're more controllable it is a it's really difficult to give one answer for um as as a generic answer but i think the importance is understanding where your risks are where your liquefiable zones are and then making an appropriate choice for the circumstances. And I would argue that time is not an appropriate argument. There's not enough time to do it because the earthquake, the next earthquake will jump up and bite you right where you, it hurts. So I think we should always try and do the right thing. Thank you. And and seeing as how we do a Bit of that here in the west coast of california I'd, I'd say that even economics as far as uh, dynamic compaction unless you had uh, other structural reasons or people nearby um, that is probably one of the least co or lowest cost of any ground modification methods you could use certainly and it's very fast so you also might consider compaction grouting um, Let's continue. And uh, we're now 12 minutes past the hour. We have another class coming in here in 15 minutes, so we'll have to probably wrap things up. But uh, uh, we have another one here. As an engineering student from Turkey, I'd love to ask the awareness of a seismic risk around the world. Because we've seen last month just, excuse me, we've seen last month just only the code does not reflect the application. Well, I think. Well, I think <laughs> it, it's interesting over the last uh, six weeks I've been dealing with the press a lot uh, in the UK in Europe and, and elsewhere and trying to have a sensible conversation with the press uh, to help educate the public about what what's happened in this earthquake and it's clear that generally the public want to find a person or a group of people to blame. And th that's impossible. There are so many parts to how things have transpired during the earthquake. Could there have been 
inappropriate design? Could there have been inappropriate construction? Could there have been inappropriate regulation? Were the right materials used? Was the earthquake double the size it was it was expected? We it will take time to really understand all of that before we can understand what happened. Uh, I think people in some regions are very aware of the seismic risk, and I would say Japan is right at the forefront of that. Uh, other regions are far less uh, aware, and I think we have a golden moment over the next three or four years to really push the concept of seismic risk and the concept of uh, resilience from earthquake and from an earthquake perspective uh, in communities such as um, southern Turkey uh, and elsewhere. And again, it's down to us as engineers to try and uh, really shout about it and try and get people to think differently. Uh, next question is from, uh, I'm just going to say, Rajiv. Uh, climate change factors, uh, actually, what is your take that climate change factors should be introduced into the seismic building codes of all countries, especially in high seismic zones? Uh, uh, it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, I actually think performance-based design in its basic form and the attempt to ensure resilience is part of that because if we can ensure our buildings last two or three or four times longer than they currently do that's going to save a whole heap of carbon and hence improve uh, the, the construction footprint um, how to actually impose that in codes? Well, there are regulations in Europe now uh, for mitigating the amount of carbon in our builds, and we need to tie that together. And, you know, I've been just doing earthquake engineering for the last 33 years, and the whole issue of climate change is relatively new, but we need to embrace it. We need to understand it and we need to ensure that when we design, we're not just designing for safety from an earthquake perspective, but we're worrying about the impact of our building on the on the climate and how can we can minimize that. And it there's a balance there, but uh, I think you know, th there are regulations in place and we just need to be fully aware of them. It looks like we've come down to the last one, and this again is about uh, the ground improvement. Uh, it's a comment that there's also been uh, research into uh, uh, air injection for liquefaction countermeasures. Um, there certainly is. Yeah. Um, no, no, of course. <laughs> I was going to say yes, and we've used it ourselves, uh, though how long that air remains in the ground is. Uh, questionable and you've got to also consider uh, recharge so it's really it may only be appropriate in certain climates good point uh, one last question are you aware of any poor performance of seismically isolated structures during these events and if so uh, what were the causes if any um, yeah, there were a number of hospitals which were being built at the time of the earthquake, and some of them had uh, seismic isolators. Uh, there, I haven't seen the details of those, but some of those performed well and others didn't. I don't know. That will come out um, in the, the reports from ERI and EFIT and others uh, very shortly. Uh, so I think it is uh, a good question and something we should really uh, look at carefully. Well, excellent. Well, that 
concludes the uh, Q&A section of this, as well as uh, our uh, presentation for this event. Thank you very, very much, Ziggy. We really appreciate it. Stay tuned next month for our next uh, uh, seismic seminar. Um, I will be following up with all of you with an email with the summary of this, question answers, and well, as well as I'll be uh, letting you know where you can find this presentation on our website and uh, et cetera. So again, thank you all very, very much for your, your time and attention. And thank you, Vivi. Thanks, Tim. And thanks for everybody for uh, putting up with uh, my English accent. It always makes it seem more intelligent. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you.